The great news for you and I, as leaders, focused attention beats brains, brawn, and technology every time. Focused attention beats brains, brawn, and technology every time. Leaders create shared focus. Leaders know their MVP activities. You're going to hear a lot of great sports speakers today, and you're used to MVP meaning most valuable player. I use it differently. It stands for most valuable and profitable activities. I hope you leave today knowing more clearly what your MVP activities are. Second thing you need to be a leader is focus. Third thing you need is power with people. Managers have power over people. Leaders have power with people. If you do not have a position or a title, it is a skill set that gets people to want to join you and to want to change. And that's why so much of what we talk about in leadership development is developing people skills. Harvard Business Review had an interesting article recently called Lovable Fools, Competent Jerks in the Formation of Social Networks. And the premise of the article is this. In the workplace, when you need help, you would prefer to go to a friendly, congenial person, even if they were less capable than someone that was capable but not likable. And the message was is that if you're capable, you need to be more likable. I think an important message for leadership is this. We should strive neither to be likable nor capable, but both. We should always leverage substance with style. And by style, I don't mean appearance, but our ability to be congenial, to be likable. You're going to hear Tim Sanders talk about likability later today as well. The third key is power with people versus power over people. Fourth key, you don't need a title to be a leader, but you need persuasive communication skills. Most people tell, leaders sell. Most people tell. They think that if they can provide facts and figures and statistics, that will be enough for people to make a decision. The height of arrogance is believing that your product, your service, or your idea is so good that it doesn't need to be sold. Everybody sells. Now, I notice when I talk to audiences that are not salespeople, there tends to be this resistance to selling. It's because I don't think people know what selling is. I'll give you a classic definition of selling. I don't know who originally said it. And if you've heard it before, it's worth repeating. Selling is helping people make a decision that is good for them. And if you believe that what you offer is good for the buyer, you owe it to them to sell it well. If you have a life-changing message, a life-changing ministry, a product of value, a service of extraordinary quality, it must be sold or else you run the risk of letting your customer go elsewhere for an inferior ministry experience, product, or service. You've got to go beyond telling to sell. That's what persuasive communication is. The fifth skill, if you don't have a title, you need to be a leader is IQ. Now, I do not mean IQ is measured by the Stanford Binet intelligence test. Only about 18 to 23 percent of success in life is based on intelligence quotient. I mean IQ standing for implementation quotient. It is your ability to execute. Leaders are not evaluated on their intentions. Leaders are not evaluated on their desires or their aspirations or their ambitions. They are evaluated on the results they can achieve with and through others. So the fifth key is implementation quotient. And here's the sixth key. Giving. Contribution. The most overlooked part of leadership in a secular world is the fact that leadership is not about what you get, but what you give. It is not about your resume. It is about your legacy. Most people focus on results only. I'm suggesting leaders focus on relationships and results Results that increase and improve the quality of relationships. A few years ago, my friend Charlie Tremendous Jones came to a group of us that were meeting, and he made a bold announcement. Charlie's one of the most philanthropic human beings I know, and Charlie said, I've given up on, excuse me, he said, I've given up on giving. And we couldn't believe it. We knew there was something going on. Charlie was too much of a giver to give up on giving. But he did get our attention. He was a good communicator. But Charlie went on to explain. He said, you know, In my late 70s, I've come to realize that everything I have in life is a gift. My birth, my time, the talents that I have developed, even those latent talents were a gift. I've given up on giving. I have nothing to give for the balance of my life. I will spend my time returning. Ladies and gentlemen, if you want to go beyond giving, I think the challenge is to return. I hear leaders say, you know, I want to put as much back into the system as I took out. Folks, if you do that, that's not contribution, that's barter. I think the challenge of a 360-degree leader, titled or untitled, 
is to see if they can outgive the blessings they have received in their own life to create a positive asset rather than a, a negative liability. The sixth key is giving. As you focus your agenda, as you take responsibility for impacting and influencing others, whether or not you have a title, what is ultimately the contribution that you hope to make? A couple of years ago, I got a very sobering phone call from a woman who lived here in Atlanta named Gloria Tibbs. Some of you know Gloria. Gloria was a longtime friend of mine in the professional speaking business, one of the most vivacious, enthusiastic human beings I have ever met. And I say that literally, not figuratively. Gloria also led one of the most tragic lives of anyone I've ever known. I mean, I could tell you stories that you would not believe. I mean, we all have our own challenges, but if you listen to Gloria's stories, chances are there are few in the audience today that could compare to the kind of setbacks and adversity and tragedy she'd experienced. Gloria called me a couple years ago to ask me to be a pallbearer in her funeral. She was dying of a disease, a very rare disease, that in the history of medicine only three females had ever died of. It was a disease that typically afflicted men. And of course I agreed, but I'd hoped it would be many, many years before I had to make good on my commitment. It wasn't. About six months later, I got the phone call that Gloria had passed. And at the memorial service that night, before her funeral, people were sharing memorances of, uh, of uh, Gloria. And a woman stood up and she said, you know, I never heard Gloria complain. And it was the first time I realized that I'd never heard her complain either, ever. And she said, I never heard Gloria complain, but I got angry because she was dying of this disease. And I said to her just a couple weeks before she passed, I said, Gloria, with all the bad people, all the evil in the world, why you? Why are you suffering this way? And Gloria smiled. She said, why not me? I'm strong. I've got faith. I can take it. Folks, I can't get out of bed in the morning without complaining. And now whenever I encounter a difficulty or a challenge or an obstacle or a setback, I think of my friend Gloria Tibbs, we called Glow, and I think, why not me? And when you encounter opportunity and setback and challenge, I hope that as a result of being part of this simulcast, you will not respond in the way that non-leaders respond and say, oh, Lord, why me? But instead, you will say, Lord, why not me? I'm strong. I'm tough. I have faith. I have the skills I need. I can take it. Because ultimately, it's that, not the title, that makes you a leader. Thank you.